Category O, Lecture 9, Projective Functors. Let us start with recalling the coalgebra structure on the universal enveloping algebra. Let A be a Lie algebra over K. Given two A modules M and N, we can turn the tensor product over K, the vector space M tensor over KN, into an A module using the following formula. An element A in A acts on the element M tensor N, where M is in M and N is in N, as follows. It's a sum of two elements. The first one is the action of A on M tensor N, and the second one is M tensor, the action of A on N. Note that the tensor product M tensor over KN is isomorphic to the tensor product N over KM as A modules. In particular, this means that the category of all A modules is a symmetric monoidal category. Therefore, for any object M in A mod, we have an endofunctor of A mod given by tensoring with M over K. One can formulate it differently. We have the regular representation of the symmetric monoidal category A mod acting on itself using the tensor product over K. Let us now talk a little bit about adjunctions for tensor products. Let V be a finite dimensional A module. Consider the dual module V star, which is defined as the set of all linear maps from V to K. And with the action given by A acts on the element phi from V star in the following way, the evaluation of the outcome at an element V in V is given by minus phi of A of V. So here A is an element in A, phi is an element in the dual space, and V is in V. So this minus comes from the canonical anti-involution on A. So the dual module is naturally a right module. And to turn it into a left module, we can apply the canonical anti-involution on A given by just putting the minus in front of the element. The claim is that tensoring with V star is left adjoint to tensoring with V as a pair of endofunctors on the category A mod. So let V1, Vk be a basis in V, and then consider the dual basis in V star consisting of V1 star and so on, Vk star. Given a, an A homomorphism phi from M to V tensor over Kn, where M and N are arbitrary A modules, we can write phi in the following way. Phi applied to an element M gives us a sum over all i from 1 to k of the elements of the form vi, tensor, and i with index m. So using this expression for phi, we define the element psi, which is an a homomorphism from the module v star tensor m to n, in the following way. So the, the evaluation of psi at the element f tensor m, where f is in v star and m is in m, is equal to the sum over all i, the evaluation of f at vi, this is a scalar, times the element n i m. It is easy to check that this correspondence, starting from phi and obtaining psi, defines a bijection between the space of all a homomorphisms from m to v tensor n and the space of all a homomorphism from v star tensor m to n, and that this bijection is natural in both m and n. And this exactly means the claim of the proposition. So since the double dual of v is canonically isomorphic to v, we obtain that the pair of functors tensoring with v and tensoring with v dual is actually a bijoint pair of endofunctors of A mod. Let us now talk about Costan's theorem. From now on, we consider a semi-simple finite dimensional Lie algebra G over the field of complex numbers with a fixed triangular decomposition G is equal to n minus direct sum with H, direct sum with N. 
plus. For a weight lambda, we denote by chi lambda the central character of the Verma module delta lambda. We know that any central character of the Lie algebra G has the form chi lambda for some lambda in H star. Please note that such lambda is not unique. It is only unique up to the dot action of W. Here is a theorem, which is due to Constance from 1975, and it says the following. Let M be a G module and lambda be a weight such that for each element Z in the center of the universe enveloping algebra, the element Z minus chi lambda of Z kills M. Then, given a finite dimensional G module V, and an element z in the center of the universe enveloping algebra, the following element Cz lambda v annihilates the module v tensor Cm. So the element Cz lambda v is given as a product over all weights mu in the support of our finite dimensional module v, and then we should take the element z minus the central character of the Verma module with highest weight lambda plus mu evaluated at z. So the element Cz lambda v is a product of this kind of factors. So the general idea of the proof of the theorem is as follows. V should start with the case when the module M is the Verma module delta lambda. Then we have seen already that if you start with a Verma module and tensor it with a finite dimensional module, the resulting module has a Verma flag, and the only Verma subquotients of this tensor product are the Verma modules of the form delta lambda plus mu, where mu is an element in the support of the module V. Now, by induction with respect to the usual partial order on the set of all weights, one can show that our element Cz lambda v from the formulation of the theorem annihilates the tensor product v tensor over C delta lambda. Then we need to observe that the claim of the theorem is not really a property of the module M, but rather the, a property of the image of the universe enveloping algebra in the algebra of all linear endomorphisms of M. That is, it is a property of the algebra U of G modulo the annihilator of M in U of G. There is a theorem which is due to Duflo, which says that each annihilator of a Verma module is generated by its intersection with the center of the universe enveloping algebra. And now, combining all these observations from the above, one can deduce the claim of Costant's theorem. The original paper of Costant is the paper which is called on the tensor product of a finite and an infinite dimensional representation, which was published in the Journal of Functional Analysis in 1975. Costant's theorem motivates the study of the following categories of G modules. Denote by Z the full subcategory of the category of all finitely generated G modules, which consists of all modules, the action of the center on which is locally finite. A consequence from Costan's theorem is that for any finite dimensional G module V, the functor of tensoring with V over the original field C is an endofunctor of the category Z. So if we look at the formulation of Costan's theorem, if we start with a module which has a central character, then on the tensor product of V and M, the center acts locally finitely because there is a polynomial basically in the center which kills this module. So this observation is a direct consequence of Costan's theorem. Now, for a given central character chi, let us denote by Z chi the full subcategory of Z, which consists of all modules on which the kernel of the central character chi acts locally nilpotently. Then, directly from the definition, we have a decomposition of Z as a direct sum over all central characters chi 
of these subcategories Z, chi. In particular, from Costan's theorem, we deduce that if we start from some category Z chi lambda and tensor it with some fixed finite dimensional G module V, the outcome belongs to the direct sum of the subcategories Z chi lambda plus mu, where mu runs through the support of V. Of course, directly from the definition, we know that category O is a subcategory of Z because any module in O has finite dimensional weight spaces and the action of the center preserves weight spaces. So in particular, it is locally finite. So now we can define the notion of a projective functor. The definition of a projective functor is due to Bernstein and Sergei Gilfand and comes from their 1980 paper. A projective functor is an endofunctor of the category Z, which is isomorphic to a direct summand of the functor V tensor over C, where V is some finite dimensional G module. So we saw in the previous slides that all such functors preserve the Z. So a projective functor is a direct summand of a functor of this form. So in other words, projective functors are exactly the end of functors of that, which belong to the additive closure of the end of functors of the form V tensor over C blank, where V is a finite dimensional G module. A warning, the functors are defined on the category of all G modules. However, reasonable classification results from these functors, which we will discuss later, only work for the category Z and not for the category G mode. Therefore, we restrict our consideration to this category Z. And the original paper of Bernstein and Gilfand, where projective functors are defined, is this paper, tensor product of finite and infinite dimensional representations of semi-simple Lie algebras, which was published in Compositio in 1980. So here are some elementary properties of projective functors which follow directly from the definition. The identity functor is a projective functor. It corresponds to tensoring with a trivial G module. A finite direct sum of projective functors is a projective functor because a finite direct sum of finite dimensional modules is a finite dimensional module. A direct sum of a projective functor is a projective functor. Composition of projective functors is a projective functor. This is because the tensor product of finite dimensional modules is finite dimensional. Both the left and the right adjoints of a projective functor are projective functors. This follows from our observations that tensoring with V is by adjoint to tensoring with V dual. Projective functors are exact because they have both left and right adjoints. And projective functors preserve both category O and the category of all modules in O which have Verma filtration. So this we know from our previous discussions about category O. So we denote by P the category, or rather maybe later we will consider it as a bicategory of projective functors. And from these properties, we see that P is a monoidal category with duals. It is stable under taking adjoint functors, both left and right adjoint functors. So from these properties, a very important corollary is that projective functors map projective objects in O to projective objects in O, respectively injective objects in O to injective objects in O. So this follows directly from the properties that projective functors are by adjoint to exact functors. A functor which is left adjoint to an exact functor maps projectives to projectives. And similarly, a functor which is right adjoint to an exact functor maps injectives to injectives. Great. So we want to discuss classification of indecomposable projective functors. Here is a setup necessary for this classification. Fixed to weights lambda and mu in H star. Assume that both lambda and mu are dominant in their respective dot orbits with respect to the corresponding integral vial groups. Assume also that the difference between lambda and mu is a weight of some finite dimensional G module, which means that the difference is an integral weight. So one consequence of this assumption is that the integral vial groups of lambda and mu coincide 
let us denote this common integral while group by w prime. So let g denote the dot stabilizer of lambda in w prime. Then g is a parabolic subgroup of w prime. Let s be the set of simple reflections which defines this parabolic subgroup g. Let alpha 1 and so on alpha k be the simple roots corresponding to the elements in s. And finally, defined by x lambda mu, the set of all weights mu in the w prime dot orbit of mu, which have the property that the evaluation of mu at the element h alpha i is a negative integer for each i from 1 to k. So in other words, x lambda mu is a set of g antidominant weights in the dot orbit of mu with respect to our integral while group w prime. So here is the theorem by Bernstein and Gilfand, which classifies in decomposable projective functors. So this is the theorem from the paper of Bernstein and Gilfand mentioned above. So we assume the above setup. So let O lambda and O mu denote the indecomposable blocks of O containing the simple highest weight modules L lambda and L mu, respectively. Claim one. For each element mu in the set X lambda mu, there is a unique indecomposable projective functor, which we denote by theta lambda mu, from the category O lambda to the category O mu, which sends the projective module P lambda to the projective module P nu. Moreover, every indecomposable projective functor from O lambda to O mu is isomorphic to theta lambda nu for some weight nu in the set X lambda nu. For the full proof of the theorem, we refer to the original paper of Bernstein and Gilfand. In the next lectures, we will discuss basic objects, techniques, and ideas which are behind this proof. So here is an SL2 example. So if you consider the Lie algebra SL2, then the set of weights of SL2 can be identified with complex numbers, where the roots of SL2 coincide with the numbers 2 and minus 2, and the basis of our root system is the number 2. So the integral weights of SL2 then exactly the integers inside the complex numbers. And the while group of SL2, is, which is isomorphic to the symmetric group S2 and consists of, of the identity E and the simple reflection S, it acts on H star simply by changing the sign. The one half of the sum of all positive roots is equal to one. And the dot action, which is a row shifted action, is defined in the following way S dot C is equal to minus C minus two. So we have two possibilities for the dot stabilizer of a weight. The dot stabilizer can be trivial in case lambda is an integral weight, which is different from minus one. And the dot stabilizer can be the whole while group in the case lambda is equal to minus one, which is minus rho. We will have four different cases for the classification of indecomposable projective functors between integral blocks, depending on the stabilizer of the domain block and the target block. So consider two non-negative integers lambda and mu. So the claim is that there are exactly two indecomposable projective functors from O lambda to O mu, namely theta lambda mu and theta lambda minus mu minus two. This is because the dot stabilizer of lambda is trivial and the block O mu has two highest weights, mu and minus mu minus two. There is a unique indecomposable projective functor from O lambda to O minus one, namely theta lambda minus one. This is because the stabilizer of lambda is trivial and O minus one has a unique highest weight, minus one. The non-trivial case is that there is a unique indecomposable projective functor from O minus one to O mu, namely the functor theta minus one minus mu minus two. So the point is that there is no indecomposable projective functor theta minus one mu. 
So this is because this dot stabilizer of minus one is the whole group W, and out of the two weights mu and minus mu minus two, which appear as highest weights in all mu, only minus mu minus two is antidominant with respect to the whole while group W. Mu is not antidominant, so such indecomposable projective functor is not there. And finally, there is a unique indecomposable projective functor from O minus one to O minus one, namely the functor theta minus one minus one. Let us now construct these indecomposable projective functors in more detail. So consider the regular block O0 and the singular block O minus two. So in, block, in the block O0, we have two highest weights, zero and minus two. And in the block O minus one, we have the unique highest weight minus one. If you consider the natural SL2 module C2, then the support of this module consists of the weights minus one and one. Of course, theta lambda lambda is the identity factor for any lambda. This follows directly from the definitions and the classification. So what we want to do, we want to construct non-identity projective functors. And let us start with, with computing what we will get if we tensor the Verma module delta zero with the natural SL2 module C2. So this tensor product has a Verma flag, as we know, with subquotients obtained by taking zero and adding elements in the support of C2. So it has a Verma flag with subquotients delta minus one and delta one. Therefore, if we now project onto the block O minus one, we see that delta one is not in that block, so it will die, and we will get exactly delta minus one. So tensoring with C2 followed by projection onto O minus one gives us the indecomposable projective functor theta zero minus one, which sends the Verma module delta zero to the Verma module delta minus one. Using exactly the same kind of reasoning, we see that if we now tensor delta minus one with C2, we get a module which has a Verma flag with Verma subquotients delta zero and delta minus two. Note that delta minus one is projective in O minus one. So this module also must be projective in O zero. And from this, it follows that the only possibility for this module is that this module is equal to the projective cover of L minus two. Therefore, this functor on the nose gives us the indecomposable projective functor theta minus one minus two. And to obtain the indecomposable projective functor theta zero minus two, we can take the composition of theta zero minus one and theta minus one minus two. This composition sends the Verma module delta zero to the projective module P minus two. So this is an explicit construction of these indecomposable projective functors. So one very nice application of this classification of projective functors is the following statement, which tells us that many blocks of category O are equivalent. Assume that lambda and mu are two dominant weights in the integral while groups, such that the difference between them is integral and the stabilizers of these two weights in the common integral while group coincide. Then the claim is that the corresponding blocks O lambda and O mu are equivalent. Proof. Since the stabilizers of these two weights coincide, using the BG's classification theorem, we have a the indecomposable projective functor theta lambda mu from O lambda to O mu, which sends delta lambda to delta mu. So these both are dominant projective modules. Similarly, in the opposite direction, we have the indecomposable projective functor theta mu lambda from O mu to O lambda, which sends delta mu to delta lambda. Their composition in one way, theta lambda mu followed by theta mu lambda, is a projective endofunctor of O lambda, which sends delta lambda to delta lambda. By the classification, this functor must be isomorphic to the identity functor. 
The same reasoning, their composition in the opposite order is a unique and decomposable projective functor of on O mu, which sends delta mu to delta mu. So again, it must be isomorphic to the identity factor. So this means that these two functors are mutually inverse equivalences of categories. So if we have two blocks of O with the same integral while group and the same stabilizer of the dominant weights, these two blocks are equivalent. Now let's talk about the special class of projective functors, which are called translations through walls. Consider a regular dominant and integral weight lambda and fix a simple reflection S. Consider a singular dominant integral weight mu with the dot stabilizer, which consists just of the identity and our fixed simple reflection S. Definition, the projective functor theta lambda mu is called the translation to the S wall and usually denoted by theta S on. It's a joint, the in decomposable translation functor theta mu S dot lambda is usually called the translation out of the S wall and denoted by theta S out. And the composition of the translation onto S wall followed by the translation out of the S wall is usually denoted by theta S and called the translation through the S wall. So this is the indecomposable projective functor theta lambda, comma s dot lambda. So as I already mentioned, the functor theta s on and theta s out can be identified as certain unique summons of tensorin with V and its dual, and hence they are bijoint. So in particular, it follows that the functor theta s is self-adjoint. And of course, from the definition, the functor theta s sends the Verma module delta lambda to the indecomposable projective module P s dot lambda. By the BGG reciprocity, the module P s dot lambda has a Verma flag with subquotients delta lambda and delta s dot lambda, and both of these Verma modules appear with multiplicity one. Therefore, we have a short exact sequence, a non-split short exact sequence. Delta lambda is a submodule of theta s delta lambda with the corresponding quotient delta s dot lambda. We claim that this can be generalized. For any element w in the while group, such that ws is bruja greater than w, we have that theta s applied to the Verma module delta w dot lambda is isomorphic to theta s applied to the Verma module delta ws dot lambda, and moreover, there is a short exact sequence. Delta W dot lambda is a submodule of this common module theta S times delta W dot lambda, and the corresponding quotient is delta W S dot lambda. So since W S is Bruja bigger than W, then of course delta W S dot lambda is a submodule of delta W dot lambda. And we know that all Verma modules can be realized inside delta lambda. This means that if we now apply the translation to the wall delta S on, then both these modules, of course, they have Verma flex, and they are submodules of the Verma module delta nu, which is delta S on applied to delta lambda. So they have Verma flex and they are submodules of one Verma module, so they should be Verma modules. And then it is easy to see, just by tracking what happens to the highest weights, that delta S on applied to delta W dot lambda is isomorphic to delta S on applied to delta W S dot lambda. And this is a Verma module delta W dot mu, which is equal to the Verma module delta W S dot mu, because S dot mu is equal to mu, S in the dot stabilizer of mu. So this gives us the first claim of the proposition. So next claim is that because theta s applied to delta lambda has Verma flag of length two, it follows that theta s applied to delta w dot lambda also has Verma length two, and by adjunction we see that delta w dot lambda is a submodule of this module, and delta w s dot lambda is a quotient. So after these formulas, it's interesting to look at what happens 
on the level of the Grotten D group. So we consider the Grotten D group of the block O lambda. Recall that this Grotten D group has three natural bases. The most natural one is a basis of simple modules, but we have also proved that it has a basis given by Verma modules and also the basis given by projective modules. We identify the Grotten D group of O lambda with the free Z module generated by elements of W by sending the class of the Verma module delta W dot lambda to the element W in Z of W. Recall that projective functors are exact, and therefore each projective functor on O lambda induces a linear transformation of the Grotten D group of O lambda. So now we denote by P lambda lambda the monoidal category of all projective and the functors of O lambda. It follows that the Grotten D group of O lambda is a module over the split Grotten D ring of this monoidal category. So let us also denote by theta w the projective functor theta lambda w dot lambda. Then, of course, from the classification zero of projective functors, the split Grotten D ring has a natural basis consisting of the classes of indecomposable projective functors. These are exactly the classes of theta w, where w is an element in w. And this is, of course, a free abelian group of rank the number of elements in W. So the original paper of Bernstein and Gilfand on projective functors also contains the following observation. So there is a ring isomorphism from this split Grotten Dick ring to the integral group ring of the Weyl group. Under this isomorphism, the Grotten Dick group of O lambda becomes a right regular module over the integral group ring of W. Proof. So let us consider the Grotten Dick group of O lambda as a which is isomorphic to that of W by our assumptions as a right regular module over ZW, over this ring. By the short exact sequences which we had before, the action of the class of the translation theta s through the s wall is given by right multiplication with the element 1 plus s. If you go to this short exact sequence, the element delta w dot lambda is identified with w, and when we apply theta s, we get w plus ws. So the action of theta s in this basis is given by right multiplication with 1 plus s. Also, if w is an element in w and we have a reduced expression of w, s1, s2, and so on, sk, then combining the short exact sequences above, we see that if we start from delta lambda and apply the decomposable projective functor theta s1, theta s2, and so on, theta sk, the, the outcome surjects onto the simple module L w dot lambda. In other words, the indecomposable projective functor theta w is a summand of this composition. Therefore, all translations theta s through s walls, where s is a simple reflection, they generate the category p lambda lambda as a monoidal category. So since the generators are given by elements in ZW. It follows that so the Grotendieck ring of the category P lambda lambda belongs to the algebra ZW acting on the Grotendieck algebra of O lambda. But since projective modules form a basis of O lambda, it follows also that this split Grotendieck ring of P lambda lambda actually equals to ZW. So this inclusion is actually an isomorphism because projective modules form a basis here. So this implies the statement of the theorem, and the statement of the theorem can be formulated in modern terms as the categorification of the right regular module over the integral group algebra of the while group. 
So the action of projective functors on a regular block of category O categorify the right regular module over the integral group algebra of the while group. Here is an SL3 example. So consider the regular block of category O for SL3. So the while group of SL3 is the symmetric group S3. It has six elements, the identity E, two simple reflections S and T, their products ST and TS, and the longest element W0, which is equal to STS and TST. Using the short exact sequences above, one can compute the matrices of the actions of translations through the S and the T's wall in the basis of Verma modules. So they are given by the following matrices. So theta S, so this column means that theta S applied to delta E has a Verma flag with delta E and delta S. The second column, theta S applied to delta S, has a Verma flag with delta E and delta S, and so on. And similarly for T. Since for this particular block, we know the Verma characters of indecomposable projective modules, we can compute using these matrices that uh, the composition of theta S and theta T gives us theta TS, the composition of theta T and theta S gives us theta ST, and the composition of theta T, theta S, and theta T gives us theta TST plus theta T, and the composition of theta S, theta T, and theta S gives us theta STS plus theta S. For these first two things, note that we have a right action, so S after T gives us TS. And here are the computation details. So let us compute theta S composition with theta T. So theta T times delta E has a Verma flag with Verma's delta E and delta T. The class of theta T delta E gives us the class of theta E plus the class of delta T. So further, if we now apply theta S, so we should apply theta S to delta E and plus theta S applied to delta T. Theta S applied to delta E gives us modules delta E and delta S. Theta S applied to delta T gives us modules delta T and delta TS. By the BGG reciprocity, we know that the character of the projective PTS is exactly delta E plus delta S plus delta T plus delta TS. Consequence, theta S composition with theta T is theta TS. So one more step, let's take this equality and apply theta T. Again, we have to apply theta T to all four summons. In each case, we multiply with T, so we have E plus T, so here S plus ST, here T plus E, and here TS plus delta W0. By the BGG reciprocity, PW0 has each verma once, and we, if we subtract each verma once, we have the extra delta T plus delta E, which give us the copy of PT. The consequence, the composition of delta T, delta S, and delta T is delta W0 plus delta T. So this is how one computes compositions of projective functors using characters of projective modules. So here's an interesting question. How can one compute the basis of the classes of theta W of the split Grotendieck ring of the monoidal category of projective functors? So since we know that uh, the, for the dominant weight lambda, the class of the dominant Verma module delta lambda is the same as the class of the indecomposable projective module p lambda, and it corresponds to the element E in, the, in our integral group algebra. If we apply theta w to p lambda, we should get p w dot lambda. So this means that this basis of theta w inside ZW coincides with the basis of indecomposable projectives in the Grotendieck group of category O. So by the BGG reciprocity, the transformation matrix from indecomposable projectives to Verma modules is transposed to the transformation matrix from Verma modules to simple modules. So in order to understand this basis, we need to understand composition multiplicities of Verma modules. And we will do this later in the course. So here are some questions for PhD students. Question number one, fill in all the details in the proof of the junction of tensor in with V and tensor in with V star. Question number two, 
let V and V prime be two simple finite dimensional G modules. Prove that V tensor V prime has as a summand the trivial G module if and only if V prime is isomorphic to V dual. Question number three. Let V and V prime be two simple finite dimensional G modules. Prove that there is a projective functor which sends V to V prime. Question number four. Let V be a simple finite dimensional G module and V prime be a simple infinite dimensional highest weight module. Prove that no projective functor can send V to V prime. Question number five. For G is equal to SL3, compute the matrices of the linear operators given by theta S and theta T in the basis of the classes of simple modules. Thank you very much. See you next time.